Hi, my name is John Green. I wrote a book called Looking for Alaska. I'm going to talk to the cast of Looking for Alaska. Who is that? Alaska Young. Alaska? My reputation precedes me. Can y'all talk about when you first read the book and what you thought of it? Yes, we can. <laughs> yes, we can. Yeah. Should we already Who would you like, who would like I'll to start? St I'll who? start with Christine. Ooh. Mm. Ooh. Well, I read it for the first time in high school and I just really remember feeling so much less alone. I remember feeling like I could really relate, not only to Alaska, but to kind of each character. Mm -hmm. I feel like you really put like those thoughts and feelings onto paper so well. Um, you know, I've gone through struggles um, with, with growing, and I just felt really like I could relate. Did you think to yourself like, oh, I wonder if someday I'll be Alaska? No, <laughs> never, <laughs> ever would I ever, no, never, no. Well, I'm very glad that you are. Thank you. I'm really glad I got to do it too. Denny? So are we going, okay. Well, yeah, uh, we're doing the whole. I, I personally, I didn't know about the story before the audition. So I was a little late to the party, <laughs> which I actually felt was a good thing because if I had known the weight of this project, I probably would have trash the audition <laughs> but when i did find out about it i just got the first uh, episode i read the first episode and i just remember thinking this story was really special and uh i was telling a friend about it and i was like yo i think i found like my thing never let the colonel rope you into helping him move he's immune to fatigue his anger is a renewable energy source and you did make a commitment i did i still had my day job at <laughs> the time so i was like i think i found the thing like my my moment, you know, my project. And uh, my friend was like, so what, it, what is it called? And I was like, it's called like, trying to find Alaska, something about, something about Alaska. And I'm like, oh my God, is it looking for Alaska? I love that book. So I went to Barnes and Noble, instantly bought the book, read it in like a day. And at that point I was like, yo, this story is like, unlike anything I've ever read. And at that point I knew I needed to be a part of it for sure. Jay? Uh, well, Denny and I have a very similar situation in that, you know, I also didn't know about the book. Um, so I went in for the audition. <laughs> um, so I went in for the audition and then was very lucky to, you know, also get the screen test. And then in between that audition and the screen test, I got to read the book. Um, and I did get very overwhelmed because I realized that it was going to be a very special something to hopefully be a part of. Miles Halter, Orlando, Florida, attendant of Dr. Phillips High School. Interesting side note about Dr. Phillips High School, named after a guy named Dr. Phillips. Didn't have a PhD or anything, just as an adult, changed his name to doctor. And then when I, when I did, you know, get the good news that we had, we had booked it, um, I ended up telling, I was directing a play at the time at USC, fight on. And one of the uh, cast members who was, who was a student there, he came up to me and he goes, look, I don't mean to like weird you out or anything by telling you this, but I have a friend in, you know, in high school and she went through a really difficult time and um, there was kind of a scare for all of us and somehow, one way or another, she got a hold of this book. Mm. And that's the book that really got her through. It got her through that hard time. And that, you know, hearing that firsthand from somebody and I just happened to mention the title of the series, you know, it, it really struck home for me. That's that's when I really realized that we're doing something. We're doing something that's yeah. that we're very fortunate to be yeah. a part of bringing to life. That's crazy. Yeah, I yeah. hear that a lot. Hearing that is really overwhelming, uh, and I, I'm really grateful. I mean, you you have to get lucky with the book, you know. I mean, uh, and I feel like I got really lucky with that one. It's been read so generously by so many people, and I just uh, yeah, that that's really nice to hear and. Kind of overwhelming. Wow. When I was 15, and I just remember thinking kind of the opposite. I know you asked Christine, like, did she feel like she was Alaska? I really felt like I just connected so much with the character of Pudge, especially. And You really memorized last words? Yeah. You want to quiz me? JFK. That's obvious. Is it now? Oh, no. Uh, those are his last words. <laughs> Um, probably to a fault even. I really just felt so connected to his thought process and what he wanted so much out of life at that moment in his life. And um, it was something where immediately I remember reading it and then finding out that there was a movie version possibly being made and then desperately wanting to be a part of that and doing everything I possibly could to try and then it not working out and then it all kind of coming back around to this now and getting to do it as a miniseries too, like, 
it all just really kind of worked out in a pretty magical way but um but yeah no that was that was really that first experience and i remember it so vividly i remember like reading the book in my the front room of my house and just like putting it down and immediately being like i gotta mm. be a part of this somehow. <laughs> <laughs> didn't you write him a letter yeah. i did yeah, yeah. I did. it's a great letter it was a great letter <laughs> You, um, yeah, I, I haven't read it. I read it when I um, got it now, recently, back a year ago now. Yeah. It's really sad, actually, because I was like, oh, that's what was going on in my life at the time. And, like, yeah. it really was so in line with what I think, you know, mm. the character of Pudge is really has going on when he starts his journey as well. So Yeah, yeah. it was a really personal letter. I uh, Yeah, I, I appreciated very much that you were willing to share that with me and and you know when when you were cast that was my first thought was it's just amazing that you know it's Charlie and he feels such a connection to Miles and really I mean I saw all of your audition tapes and there were so many great actors I don't want to criticize anyone there were lots of wonderful actors who uh, tried out for these roles but I mean uh, yeah, you were all just perfect, and I feel like that you see that in the show, like the co sense of camaraderie you have, that sense that you have, like what I really wanted for the story was how much in an insular environment like that, your friends become your family, mm. and how, and, like, and, and even seeing y'all on set together for the first time, I was like, oh, they've got it. Like they're, <laughs> they're already there. Oh. I'm still mad at you for coming that first day. That, that was the scariest me. thing of my life. Really? Yes, yes man. Why? What do you mean? <laughs> you John Green. I ran. <laughs> I did. What do you mean? You John, John Green. Green. <laughs> That's the new, yeah. That's no. <laughs> new. You, got, you, you guys were great on the first day. I, no. I wasn't nervous. I was nervous until I got there and I started to see y'all do scenes and then I was like, oh, this is, this is going to be really good. I think he was gone by the time I, we got to my scene, my yeah, first day. <laughs> you are so lucky. Yeah. I like that. One of the questions I wanted to ask you is if it was weird to play a character who had been inside of a book for you. Like if, if it was weird to like think about, oh, lots of people have read this story and lots of people have ideas about this character, or if you felt like, no, nah, I understand this person. Because yeah. from my perspective, and I think I said this to each of you, you know, you understood these characters in ways that I couldn't, you know, it, you understood them deeply and from the inside, and so I was never worried. But I, I wonder if, if it was intimidating in any way for y'all. For me, it was definitely weird, because I was like, how did this dude put me in a book? I just <laughs> felt like that. I just honestly felt like I understood this character so much and related so much to the character that it was shocking. I just felt like the role was written for me in a really weird way. And I don't even know if the Colonel was black or his race never really played a factor in my mind when I read the book. But I just felt like I understood this character, his rage, his sense of humor. I just really felt like a strong connection to him. It was shocking that it was written, I felt like for me. And it probably wasn't, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were, I think you were four when it came out. So it wasn't written yeah, for no. you yet. No. I mean, you may have had some like spiritual epiphany. I yes, don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I think. Don't Char take that away from me. I think me. Charlie was actually four uh, when crazy. the book came when out. When the book come out? Two thousand five. Yeah, I was six. Oh, oh my yeah, god. Yeah, so you were. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, kindergarten Charlie must yeah. have been adorable. I know. He was. I got. I've seen some baby. <laughs> yeah, I he did was. send you. Cute. Yeah, I had a little cute. thing going on. <laughs> <laughs> I had a little style. <laughs> did you? I was were you six. St yeah, my parents dressed me well. Um, I actually just watched a bunch of home movies. My parents just dug up a bunch of home. Anyway, that's not why I work. <laughs> <laughs> was that weird for you to play a person that was in a book? Um, yeah. I mean, I definitely. I think honestly. If I didn't care so much about the story, I probably would have had an easier time with it. As just a fan, like honestly, if I weren't a part of this, I would probably be judging the hell out of us right Absolutely. now and be like ready <laughs> to be like, all right, they better not have messed this up. Yeah, I've been trolling. Um, yep. So I think that was a big <laughs> thing. Like if, if I hadn't been a big fan of it, then I probably wouldn't have cared so much. But yeah, I was so 
Same. Scared. I've, you know. I felt that way, but it really helped doing the trip with you to Alabama. That's mm, when I feel yeah. like I kind of let go of all the expectations and, and you know the things online and yeah, when when it's, we got to right. do that trip. It's really hard not to hear um, stuff online, especially yeah. because positive comments don't penetrate. No, yeah. yeah. Right? Like <laughs> yeah. You, you don't feel them. Yeah. Like people like people give you good reviews and you're like, mm, no, no, no. <laughs> let's, keep, let's keep looking Where further to find yeah, the yeah, truth. Yeah, okay. Where they yeah. They yeah. The, and the truth is all, and, and then the negative things always feel like penetrate there right go. through yeah. you. Yeah. Right. There, I, I there found it is. It. All right, I'm good for the week. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's so true, and it's a really it's a really difficult thing. And I think it would be a very very difficult thing to go through when you're young. I mean, it's one mm. thing for for me, you know, I I am a middle aged dad living in Indianapolis. Uh, you know, most of my sense of self is formed, but I do worry a lot about young people having to go through the gauntlet of social media, and and it's very hard because we don't always think of each other as people when we're talking online no. and it's a that's a bummer yeah. definitely and in some ways i mean that's you know it, it's part of what i was trying to write about is that it's very hard to imagine other people complexly to see other people as full humans it's very easy to romanticize mm -hmm. or essentialize them or dehumanize them in various ways and the consequences of that can really be catastrophic yeah definitely that was deep. Sorry, I didn't mean to take it down to a bummer. <laughs> no, I've got some great. funny questions but that's as well. So, I think that's really right on and yeah. why even especially now a story like this is so important. Yeah. You know, especially when yeah, it comes to young people because I think, what would you say? No, you go ahead. Oh, no. That's a, <laughs> no. Anyway, yeah, no. I, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't, want, I didn't want to cut you off. No. So. <laughs> that was very sweet, guys. Yeah, yeah. it was. It was. <laughs> um, so... The book came out, as, we, as we've talked about a little bit, the book came out in 2005. That was, for me, three or four weeks ago, but I understand that for y'all it was probably a long time ago. What were some of your favorite parts about like going back in time and being able to make something set in a time that you probably only hazily remember, if at all? The clothes. Clothes. Yeah. And the music. The music for the sure. The no cell yeah. phones. No yeah. cell phones. I love that. Yeah, that's that just blows my mind. It's hard to envision a time before cell phones because it's really like taking over the way we communicate and deal with people. That was so you really just had to be present. I felt so much more present when even, just trying to take in that material. On location we didn't even have cell phones. Yeah, yeah, that was dope. Yeah. yeah, it all kind of, it all kind of, <laughs> it all kind of worked out. Sad. Like it did perfectly. The environment we shot it in really reflected. I mean, and and that was I know something that you talked about when you first mm -hmm. got there as well. Just in the look of the location that we were shooting in, but even just tonally, like, you know, it was very similar to I think what hopefully that environment would have been yeah. like at the time. Yeah. And for us as a cast, compared to what these kids would you know be feeling at the school. Jay, you had the most, I would say, extreme costumes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so oh, nice. How do you really? mean? <laughs> so much. What was drip. it? What was it like uh, embodying the, that uh, that Takumi fashion? Well, I I actually think that the the fashion made the character happen for me because mm. you know it was it was something where internally I I identified with a lot of things that this this person might or could have been going through. Um, but you know, some of the swag that was even coming off the page, I didn't yeah. I didn't get, you know, right away. And then I had one fitting with Matthew Simonelli, our, our cost, costume designer. And he put me into just a ton of drop crotch pants. And then all of a sudden <laughs> I had a voice and a walk and like every, everything just kind of like came together because of that. I never got used to wearing outfits that cost more than my rent you know like that was always very uncomfortable for me and i would like be careful like i'd always like lay paper towels down before i sat down oh yeah. um, jay had the budget the clothing budget was <laughs> yeah. for sure the show is very funny i was surprised by how much i laughed and how much joy and laughter there is in the show there are also some hard parts um that left me sobbing. Eternal sadness. You guys don't trust me? Something terrible is happening. It's not fair. You don't have a choice. It's the human condition. And 
watching that, I kept thinking about y'all as people, and I wonder what it was like and what got you through the difficult times making this show. I think that something that I've I've learned personally um, is that you know the the journey of life is is very repetitive and it's long and there we, we ride um, high crests of you know good waves joy camaraderie and then and then we also have low crests and there it, it, we feel very alone and I think it's it's easy in those times to feel like this is the entirety of the rest of my life but I think if we can remember that the journey of life kind of happens in this kind of a roller coaster wave like way then it, it, it's always been helpful for me to remind myself, oh, this is just another one of those low waves. Yeah, yeah. it's so hard to feel like now is not forever. Yeah. Because definitely. when it's when it's happening and when it's bad, it um, it can you know it can really take. I mean, I, I speak from experience. I've lived with depression for a lot of my life, and when it's bad, it always feels like forever. But now is never forever right. mm. and there's a there's a Liberian proverb actually that I uh, think about a lot no condition is permanent mm. Mm. and that's true for good conditions right and it's true for bad conditions yeah and you know yeah and there is yeah that, that's that's what I hope people take away too is a yeah. sense of of hope like when I was writing the book uh, this idea was very much in my head I just dropped out of divinity school so uh, wow. there was a lot of you know thinking about uh, the the big questions of meaning at the time for me and there's this idea that I found very powerful of, of radical hope the idea that like mm. hope is available to all people at all times no matter what um, and and I really do believe that yeah I mean it I mean to me it just makes the most sense and when I think about you know this idea of hope I also feel like by the end of this story people will feel like a, a huge amount of gratitude towards these characters and this story because I left that last day of shooting just felt I left feeling so hopeful especially after we had been shooting so much intense stuff by that last episode I just was left feeling like these characters in this world everybody was going to be okay which to me is a huge you know reflection of your writing and Josh and Stephanie P people aren't going to be left feeling hopeless after they you know, finish the series, which is, to me, the point of the story. We want to feel uplifted by the time it's over. Yeah, I really believe, like, I, I think in some ways this makes me a little old-fashioned, but, like, I really believe that all true stories are hopeful stories mm -hmm. because I believe that hope is correct, for lack of a better term. Like, I believe that, like, hope is the right response to the human condition. Not, mm. like, easy or cheap hope, which is plentiful and totally useless right? right like because when you need it is when you're in those really difficult times and the easy che cheap hope never helps mm. then mm -hmm. but i do I, I i and yeah i really really believe um that there is hope even when your brain tells you there isn't mm. and and you know you just have to you just have to get there you just have to reach out for help you yeah. have to stay the course um yeah, I really believe that. I think there's something to that. I mean, what, what you just said, you know, reach out, reaching out for help too. I mean, something that I ended up thinking about and thinking about this this project and, and the, our, our takeaways from it is that, is this thing of, of really being able to take ownership of our own grieving process, um, our own solitude um, and loneliness and, and just waking up in those days and just, um, you know, that old Simon and Garfunkel, hello darkness, my old friend, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But just having having that kind of steadfastness about it, just being able to greet our, our sadness or mourning or grieving, you know, as as a kind of friend. Mm -hmm. Here here you are, we're gonna we're gonna trudge along. you you don't get to drive, sit in the back seat, but you know, we're gonna we're gonna walk this path together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just think it's so important not to try to do that alone. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I think especially you, you know, you, you can start to feel really isolated um, when you're really sad or, or when you feel really distant from people. And mm. that's when it's so important to reach out, to reach out to someone you trust, to reach out to a friend. If you can't think of someone you trust to call uh, the National Alliance for Mental Illness has a, has a hotline. Um, I've called it before and uh, and I'm very, very glad that I did. 
So, do you have any questions about the book that I can answer, bearing in mind that I have not read the book in 15 years and you all know it better than I do? I have one. How did you feel? Because there was there's a shift in, I'm being very selfish, there's a shift in how we handled T Takumi's end journey in, in the series of the posts mm. in the book. Mm. How did you feel about that? I liked it. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, I liked it. I mean, I, I don't feel like uh, a sense of ownership over the characters. Yeah. Maybe because it's been a long time since the book came out, but I also have tried never to do that with adaptations because yeah. it's just inherently different. Like, the, the show is not made out of scratches on a page. Right, right. And so the choices have to be different. But I, yeah, I, I quite liked how, how he, where he ended up. How did you feel? I felt great about it. Okay, I good. I'm glad that we're, ha I'm glad that we're both satisfied with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. <laughs> me too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> not me at all. <laughs> Hater. Yeah. I'm yeah. kidding, I'm very happy. I have a selfish question. <laughs> sure. Too. Do you think that having the Colonel be African American changed the story anyway for you? I think that ha I think that it did expand the story in important ways. Mm -hmm. And I think it allowed um, allowed you and Stephanie and Josh and and the writers to explore things that aren't explored in the book mm. and also critically it allowed the perfect person to be the colonel which i think is the most you know the most important thing we, we you know we, we got the i i i i mean that i mean the, the there was no one better on earth to play that role and i'm just glad we got the right person can y'all see this blushing? <laughs> I can't see it, but damn, it's crazy. Anyone else? No pressure. Mm. This is not really about. I'm just. This is. I'm just curious. What having watched the whole show now, what what is one of your favorite moments? From There's a so many cinematic. Point yeah, of put view? the pressure on. There's so many. I mean, and also. For me, watching it, it's very particular because I'm. I, I kept I kept saying to Sarah that I feel like I'm in two time machines, right? Like mm -hmm. one time machine is taking me back to the year 2000, and I'm living alone in Chicago, and I'm writing in a basement, and I'm heart newly heartbroken. Mm -hmm. And there's another time machine that's taking me back to 1994, and I'm in high school, and I'm in Alabama, and then there are so. It, the whole thing was just really intense and surreal. Um, I guess I, the the night at the barn, mm -hmm. I thought was really beautifully shot, and the performances in it are so good. Um, and that was there were many many moments where I felt like exactly what I imagined when I was writing in my mind I was seeing in real life which is so surreal mm, that's crazy. and that was one that was one of them but there were lots of them like that like there were little things that that you would say or that any of you would say and it would sound so much like I hadn't heard that dialogue you know since I heard it in my head 15 years ago and it would sound so much like it sounded in my head all those years ago and it's just surreal Pretty mystic, that's crazy. I know. Man. <laughs> Man. We're all just breathing. <laughs> yeah, I really know. I'm catching my breath. I, really, I, know. I, I really appreciate it. Stop breathing. <laughs> <laughs> what you mean is John Green. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate that none of y'all have asked the qu the question <laughs> that I get that I've gotten every day for the last 15 years. Which What's the that? question? What happened? Uh oh. Oh. Um, yeah, every day, every single day, somebody emails me and asks me, like, tell me what happened, tell me what happened. I think that's such an important part of the story, though, that you don't... Yeah. I yeah, think, that you don't that's know. that's an important yeah, part of life, yeah. and I think it's important to be honest about that and not go for the easy answer. Even when your heart breaks, you have to find a way to keep living. That's always how I felt, you know? I knew from when I started the story that, that us as 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 readers and even me as a storyteller we were never going to be inside of that car yeah. and and one of the hardest things about adulthood for me or about life for me over the last 20 years has been living with big difficult questions that deserve answers that will never be answered mm -hmm. and it's it's hard and i it's something i still struggle with but i think that sometimes you don't get answers and you have to find a way 
to live anywhere. And I think it's rare to find stories that are about the not finding the answer. I feel like yeah. so much of the time, you know, we hear stories about like, you know, mm -hmm. there's a very clear question and at the end you get that yeah. very satisfying answer that you've right. been looking for. Or maybe it's the answer that you weren't looking for, but there is that kind of conclusion and I think that's what's so rare. And that's certainly what made me fall so deeply in love with the story was, was really how, I just feel like that's such an honest representation of, you know, things that I've experienced in life and, and so many people that I know of really not, and, and having to be, having that be the answer is that mm. there is no, you, there is no answer. Yeah. So I was that purposeful? Really yeah, Just that was the open. only thing I knew when I started writing the story, was that was what the story was going to be about. Um, everything else changed over the like five years that I was writing it, but that, that was very constant. My last question is not a question, it is a thank you. Um, you all poured so much of yourselves into this, and I felt that every minute of watching the show and every God that was give me emotional every day of being on set with you and I am just so grateful I know that it was not easy um, and it, it just means the world to me so thank you thank you thank you man you changed our lives and many people's lives you know so oh. thank you goes both ways yeah <laughs>